thank you very much for the introduction uh, that uh, allows me to skip two slides. Um, as mentioned, I work for JPL and have been heavily involved in model-based system engineering for, for more than a decade. I worked a long time on, on a telescope and instruments. And here is the, the, the list. And I worked a lot of them with Luigi, who is also online for, back at the European Southern Observatory. Uh, at uh, JPL, I've been involved in a number of uh, space missions, helping the projects to, uh, uh, to move gradually to a model-based system engineering environment. And as uh, you mentioned before, uh, I lead the team that is responsible for providing basically the, the digital infrastructure uh, for model-based system engineering and analysis. Uh, so where are we? Uh, so we are located in, in Pasadena, California. It's still dark outside. Uh, we are a, a so-called uh, federally funded research and development center. So we're NASA owned, but uh, funded and uh, operated by Caltech. So we're the biggest division of, of Caltech with uh, uh, around 6,000 employees. You see the, the picture there. Uh, the first few years, I didn't see the snow on the mountains. Last year, I think I did, and the year before. And now it's more like smog <laughs> because of the fires. Uh, well, it's getting better. Um, here is the, an overview of our past missions with uh, uh, all the robotic space missions from uh, landers, orbiters, uh, surveyors, and, and rovers in particular. And uh, the most prominent one, which is on its way to Mars is uh, Mars 2020 Perseverance rover. And let's cross our fingers that it will land safely there. So I've been, yeah, I've been building control systems uh, all my, most of my, my, my professional life. So I come from the side that uh, I've, I've been using modeling from the very beginning to produce something, right? I have to, I have to uh, deliver a, a production system that operates some, some machine typically. So I will drive that presentation from this perspective. So why do we want to have an executable model at all? And in particular, why do we want to have it at the system level? Uh, because most of the system engineers, uh, in particular, well, not in particular at JPL, I think at JPL also, the main tools are PowerPoint, Excel, and Word, right? and maybe some requirements management system. And uh, what, what I often observed is that uh, the behavior and uh, uh, what the system is supposed to do in terms of operations uh, uh, is, comes very late or is described in some, some narrative. So to, to have an executable system helps us to describe that system, that system much, uh, much better uh, and to gain some understanding before we actually start, start building it. We want to validate it in the, the, the requirements and the behavior in the system model. And we want to understand that those requirements better. Usually they come in some text blob and they are of course super ambiguous, but helping with the system level model, we, we can formulate it in a more precise way. And then we want, of course, to analyze the, the as designed system, how it reacts to, to user interaction, to test data, uh, scenarios, and certain uh, uh, analysis re related to, to budgets, uh, uh, like error budget, resource budgets, and, and timing constraints. So we want to also to explore the, not only the sunny day uh, behavior system, but also the, the rainy days. So what is not desired by in injecting faults and see if the design can, can cope with that. And before we start actually implementing it to check the consistency and logic of the design as, as good as we can, because there's always uh, time, time constraints, uh, of course, and uh, we can only do, do so much. Uh, we want to understand the roles of the different components in the system at the logical and the, and the physical level. And we strive for having a kind of consistency across all these artifacts that we, that we produce, the model, the code eventually for, for a control system, the documentation, simulation, and analysis. So 
Uh, that brings us to the, the topic of model-based system engineering. And uh, what is model-based system engineering? It tries to formalize all the things we do from requirements management, design capture, anal analysis, verification, validation, and, and document everything properly. And as I said, the main tool, many tools are, Excel is a prominent one and PowerPoint, and that is not super formal. So you get a lot of inconsistencies, duplicates, and so on. Usually you use some system modeling management, uh, modeling language to do that, for example, SysML uh, and or uh, Modelica, and some uh, uh, method like uh, OSAM, the object and system engineering method. So those three things are coming together and try to for you to carry out your your activities and tasks with that with support with uh, supporting modeling techniques. So this terrible picture is from the early 2000s. Uh, it's where it kind of started to get into evolved in model based system engineering, where the the big promise was okay. Today we have all these documents and documents as in the, the artifacts I mentioned before, but in the future we will have only only models. So we're moving from a document centric to a model centric world to uh, have our requirements for for interfaces, the system design, and so on. And I pitched that a lot of times, but of course it it doesn't it doesn't work. The documents won't never disappear. Uh, people want to look at the documents but we want to support them and uh, and uh, relate them and actually create those documents from the models and that's a whole other different topic that's a uh, open mb related that i will uh, uh, talk about uh, also a little bit but the models start or have started to play a, a much bigger role in in this exercise so before we go into what the current state is, let me put on my, my archaeologist hat uh, a little bit and, uh, and share my, my experiences from back in the days where I think many of you are, are much younger than I am, so might not even be have born at, <laughs> were born at that time. So the first time I, I got into, into touch something with something like uh, system level modeling when I was worked at Alcatel in the 90s. They had some system that was based on the specification design language from which uh, actually the, the UML sequence diagrams originated. And it was a kind of a nice system with graphical and textual representation. You had some semantic checker, a report generator, a code, a code generator, which didn't work. And, uh, but you could specify your system as an interconnected uh, set of, of abstract uh, uh, machines. It was used for 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 telecom systems to specify them, but it was super cumbersome to use. It was one basic state machines and sequence diagrams, and, and that was about what about what it was about it. The second time I got into touch with something was uh, when I worked at CERN, and uh, they used the system which was uh, called Foresight, and it was really very comprehensive. It had a uh, you could capture your system requirements and design, and you had a graphic execut graphical executable GUI uh, where you could see all the all your state machines executing. You could combine it with uh, uh, some action language, which uh, was derived from Ada, and it was a, a discrete event simulator that was used to to model basically the experiments of the of uh, the uh, the LHC uh, with ten thousands of of channels. And it was nice. I mean, had, back in the day, almost everything you, you needed. Uh, but then it died, and it died because it was a proprietary system. It did not integrate, it was not open, so it just disappeared. And then it took a, a, a while. Right? So here's some, some history. So 94 was the Nuthena thing, UML 97, and that's basically, I mean, before that, I used all the stuff. It, Code Jordan, Grady Booge, all these methods. And then I jumped on, on, on UML. SysML came 2007, so 10, 10 years later. Uh, and still all, both of them initially, they had, it was mostly boxes and lines. And there was, as far as I understand, also no intention to have a lot of, uh, to have it executable. Right? It was, uh, a description, an English description of what what uh, of the of the semantics, but that was not really sufficient uh, to to build something. But people still build something with it. Uh, 
somehow the big change for on the on the, the on the the professional level was when SCXML came out, the state chart uh, XML st uh, standard by the W3C, which the draft was in 2010, and uh, that's when uh, Luigi and I started to use a more model-driven or actually a very model-driven uh, approach to uh, to develop our systems, right? to have the model and to to produce something that actually. Uh, runs on the on the target system. It got standardized in 2015, so it took also several years. FUML uh, improved the situation with UML uh, quite a bit, but st still. And then it took still a, a, a number of years to get the, the precise semantics for for compositional structures uh, and the precise semantics for state machines. And thank you, Ed, for for that. He is on the call, I think, as well. But quite 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 a bit and in between uh, people uh, did something else right they had to fill in the gaps of the of the specs because uh, they wanted to provide a tool that you can that you can execute and simulate so 2011 uh, another tool came out uh, that made the first attempt of being like a, a framework not just a specific a specific tool and it took again like a number of years to get it to to maturity. But uh, it, I want to to highlight three things which are important here. First, that it's multi-engine and pluggable. So you can it's a framework that provides uh, you the, the ability to plug in different different simulation engines and different languages, uh, and it's standards based. Right? So it implements the SXML, PSSM, FUML, and, and SysML standards. And that is kind of uh, uh, very important. That's the big difference to the, the other tools that I mentioned before, uh, to be standard-based and, and open, because then you can, you can rely on something. But of course, the specs are, are imperfect. So the gaps have been filled by, by the tool vendors. And that is a, a problem from the from the practitioner side because one tool does it a little bit different than, than the other one. Right? So I, I will get to that in, in a second. And yeah, so with that framework, uh, that was 2011 was the first attempt to kind of do some kind of new system model based on 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 SysML. Uh, and it demonstrated then you can, that you can integrate state machines, parametric models, activity and interaction models, and they can work collaboratively to, to describe your system, to specify your system, and to analyze your system. And that was kind of very encouraging because you had a standard-based open environment uh, that you could work with. Of course, it took some time to, to mature. So what's the current space, uh, state of practice? So at, at, uh, at GPL, uh, so here's an, uh, some selected uh, GPL applications. Uh, the 30 meter telescope, uh, SMAP, which is a, a satellite, uh, Psyche, which is a, flies to an asteroid, uh, in the Europa land emission concept, Mars sample return. And what we do there mainly is to capture Operation, scena operation scenarios. So, how what's going to happen if the lander uh, lands on Europa? And how what will it do if it will land on ice in, in deep snow? Uh, how can it uh, uh, um, examine the, the the site and and uh, and take samples and and so on? And uh, we, to to model that and capture that, we use activities, uh, state machines, parametrics, and, and sequence diagrams. To produce a number of artifacts like interface control documents, functional design uh, documents, analysis reports, and uh, and also code eventually, hopefully. Um, so there is this slow and still slow uh, transition from writing up everything in a document before and and having a model to capture it. Still, the the engineers sketch many things in Visio first or in, 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 in PowerPoint, and then we help them. So my, my, my team helps them to, to use our environment to, to formalize that, that workflow, right? They sketch something up, we help them to formalize it in some, in some uh, SysML model, 
and we make it executable. We help them to make it executable so they get uh, get interesting uh, insights into their into their specification. So I pick two two examples, and I pick those two because one one is actually the whole model is open source, uh, which is the thirty meter telescope, and there we we started yeah maybe five years ago, about five years ago for for one for one subsystem, a fully model driven approach, overall over the, over the and then expanded it into other other subsystems. But the, it works in the in the kind of hybrid approach. Right? You lose traditional system engineering uh, for for your deliverables, and and because people are used to it, and you can trace uh, 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 things uh, more simple. And we use the model based approach to mostly or almost exclusively to to understand the behavior of, of the system. Right? For the for which is kind of was the the stepchild for many years. The behavior was always kind of a kind of a, a stepchild and to have this rich capability of modeling and executability to to represent this this kind of complex uh, systems and combine them to uh, the, combine the two so what, what are the mbc objectives of that project so we capture the operational behavior identify the involved subsystems right because you sometimes you don't know you start somewhere with some functional component and how does it interface with other components which how are the, what are the other components it has to interface to? What are the interactions between those? To the refine uh, uh, requirements, so like timing requirements for, for algorithms and also uh, interfaces to other subsystems to create a fully executable system model. And we have uh, successfully achieved that uh, with all the, the, the problems that appear. But we have a fully executable system and model that is using state machines and activities and, and, and also sequence diagrams. And that enables us to, to analyze the system design right? and verify the requirements for different aspects. How much power does it consume? Uh, what's the, the timing or duration of all these, uh, these operational behaviors? Does, do they satisfy uh, the requirements, at least of the S design system? for error to calculate error budgets and so on, but also to produce engineering uh, documents. And the goal was to use only standard languages and, and techniques and commercial off the shelf tools where, where we can and to avoid any, any kind of software development because it was, it's a it's very, very small team with a lot of work. So there was, is not much room for, for experimentation. So here is one thing that comes out of that. It's a, it's a timeline produced by the simulation where you see basically all the components involved in, uh, in one scenario in the states in, they are in and, uh, and uh, how long they're in a certain state for that scenario. So why does that help? It helps because we can quantitatively see what the components do, right? And uh, we always needed that, that information, but it was extremely costly to to produce it right uh, with with tech with PowerPoint and and Excel, you can imagine how, how, what it takes to to produce something like this. I mean, to build a model is also expensive, but that's somehow in the beginning. If it's, it's expensive, probably to build that model, but once you have it, it's cheap to update. So when we build the initial framework and, and identify the patterns. To add new things was was a, a, became a routine. Right? Identify a new use case, capture the use case, model the behavior, and 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 analyze it. So there is a, a learning curve in the beginning, but it, it it flattens out. The the other example is from uh, from SMAP, and there it was used to. Uh, to specify the behavior with the target uh, of uh, uh, to 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 get a logic design for the fault protection. So if a fault appears, how do you recover from that? How do you identify it? And it, it was a set of of uh, so that's a, a few years back uh, eight state machines with a couple of hundred of states, and uh, we used the the SIMUT executable model to identify. The behavior of each component, how they interact, the interfaces, and so on, and to to uh, to 
check the initial uh, logic of, of that design. We also applied to some extent model checking to that. And as you can imagine, the state space uh, explodes very quickly. And, but they could get some, some reasonable results uh, uh, like five, five years ago. Uh, but I see also now that we can, we can do better nowadays. So we're also working on the, on the framework uh, or a service for, for model checking to enable that. But the executable model is, is the, the key. That's the, the first thing you have to have, right? So to, to produce something which is not just boxes, boxes and, and, and lines. Uh, so, the, it, in that case, in the SMAP case, it also generated like sequence diagrams automatically from, from the execution. So, the system engineers would print them, put them on the table, and look because they like to print things and look at which, which uh, uh, components are interacting, how they're interacting, which kind of uh, messages are flowing uh, between them. So, the, the model. Uh, represents the system as, as an authoritative uh, source, right? So we used to do this analysis, but they were expensive as soon as we have the executable uh, model with, with uh, uh, specified semantics. We, we can do them and we can do it with, with, with confidence. So that's a, that's a kind of a, of a big step. But of course, there are a number of challenges, in particular with, with adoption. Uh, so my background is computer science, so I can somehow digest all these things that happen in the background, but man, mo many people are not, right? They, so the, the, I think that the problem with, uh, there's a lot of semantic issues, uh, variations across the standards and, and the tools, and uh, I list here just, just a few, so if you use one, like some slight subtle difference between SCXML and PSSM, and then across the tool, and then the. In the beginning, you somehow never know: is it if the simulation doesn't do what you expect? Is it the bug of the tool, or is it my model, model wrong, or is actually do I, is my model in my head wrong? Right. So, and uh, I I don't I want to focus only on on the the model that is wrong in my head. I don't want to 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 understand if if it's. If it's a, uh, if the semantic is correct, is compliant with the specification, or if the tool has a problem, I don't want to, to, to uh, deal with that. But I, I have to. I mean, I still, I still have to. So you shouldn't have a, a computer science degree to, to do that, in particular if you have Excel and PowerPoint as your, your main tools, and we see that in, in other languages as well, right? I mean, Java developers, they, they don't necessarily know anything about the abstract syntax or grammars and yet they produce a lot of java code and it works right and the same thing we want to to have for our system engineers right we want to to have the the system level execution analysis to be compatible with with the uh, system engineering uh, uh, practices and that's that's a that's a quite quite a challenge So another aspect is uh, is code generation, right? You have so let you have the executable model. You want to to uh, you can simulate it, but now you have actually captured a lot of the semantics. So how do you, in particular for behavior and and control systems, how do you bring it to the to the target? And uh, over over I don't know thirty years, as I said, basically starting in the nineties, I've I've Try to use what we yeah, tried, let's say, code generation and right? transformation rules and, and, and so on, and, and feeding it, trying to feed it back to the model if it change code. And it, there's always something which doesn't work. In particular, the round trip, I think, ne never worked. And if you actually generate concrete code, right, with some arbitrary rules with, and produce some arbitrary uh, code, you have also run also in kind of a lot of issues. The code might be hard to understand, hard to debug, hard to change, and you lose somehow. You still have the transformation, but you still it's it's kind of a disconnect. So in, instead, what 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 we would like to have is to have more like the model of a three D printer, right? You have your 
TAT model and you 3D print it and, and there it is. And uh, if it doesn't quite fit, then you can still you know, use your, your Stanley cutter and, 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 and shape it and update the model to make the model better and produce uh, another 3D print. Right? But it's, it's more like a, a different, and for the executable model, it's, it's similar. Right? You, you want to have uh, the same model that is executes running on the, on the target system. We don't want to have anything between, right? We want it's just just want to view it as a different level of of execution and maybe serializing in a different way, and uh, and that's kind of different from from generating code. And the first step in that direction was the the use of of SCXML because you have the, the your simulation model. It, you can have the you use the operation semantics of SCXML to simulate it. But then you produce this XML file and you use an en execution engine, which you can test uh, as much as you want and should just load that same model that you, are, that you, that you created and simulated and run it on the, on the production system. So it's, that, that's more the direction we want to go and not produce uh, thousands of lines of, 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 of code. Uh, and that enables us to do a lot of things. I mean, we can change that file easily and like we can change the, the 3D printed part and, and improve the model later on. Right? So that's, that's more the, the way we want to go. So what are the enabling technologies? Right? What, where, are we, where are we heading to? So the first thing is to, to think about the, let's say the, the traditional V model, right? You have on the left leg, you have all the, the requirements flow down, then you implement something on the, on the right leg of the V, uh, you have all the, the verification and validation activities. And uh, nowadays, you, often you try to, there's documents flowing down and test plans flowing up, but what it really has to be, we have to connect those things along the legs, but also between the legs uh, with, with a set of models, right? And those models have to be connected as well, right? So we want to drive it down from the science model to really to the subsystem models and, uh, and, and to the implementation, right? So we want to have uh, requirements management model based, the architecture design, the analysis, the VNB, right? and ideally also the, the implementation. So the, the model becomes the, the connective tissue in, in all these exercises, right? So, so nowadays you have, you might have some model actually, so people build models, but then they cut, copy paste everything into a document, document and give it to the, the person, for example, for, for flight software to implement. Right? So you have immediately a disconnect. And then we produce test cases based on that code maybe. Instead, we want to have the, the model that connects all those things, right? So we can, uh, we can keep the documentation code, the test cases, and the analysis uh, uh, connected, and they're not anymore a, a disjointed uh, picture. So that's this transformation that we are uh, transformation in terms of the culture right? and the and the technology we want to work on. Uh, that comes. So another objective is is to build some end-to-end goal-based executability framework. So you, you have like a producer system model of the control architecture that also enables autonomy. You have an executable set of requirements, you clarify the understanding of the control architecture, perform the analysis and build transformation. And the, the analogy I draw here is, is with Google Maps, right? So everybody, almost everybody, at least in the US, uses Google Maps. You enter your, your destination, Google figures something out and directs you by go. Okay, turn, turn right, turn left, go straight, uh, and you follow this instruction. Right? You're becoming the, Google gives you a goal and you try to perform this goal to your, your best abilities. Right? If you can, you try to turn right at the next traffic, traffic stop and you do whatever is necessary to do that. So you're trying to achieve that goal. Uh, and if you can't, then Google will figure out something else, right? You miss the, the, the right turn uh, and Google ah, rerouting. Well, it recalculates the, the, 
the, the network of goals and gives you new directions. And that's also very important for, for, uh, for a control system, right? Instead of procedurally prescribing every step that you have to do, which is hard to change, you want to move to a more goal-oriented uh, framework, but it should go the whole, the, the whole way from the design, analysis, simulation, to the implementation. The second part is, is an environment, a model-based engineering environment. And uh, a key role plays there, the, the OpenMB community. And uh, today there's actually, in, in 45 minutes, there's the, the first uh, OpenMB workshop uh, at the models. We had a few at the, uh, in, in COSI at the International Council of, uh, on System Engineering uh, from, uh, with a lot of parti uh, partition, uh, uh, participants from the practitioner side, from industry uh, mostly. But this community built over the last, let's say five, six years and uh, they all have the same goal. They all need uh, a, a model-based engineering environment right, to, to handle the the complexity of the increasing complexity of the systems uh, and do this transformation of the system engineering uh, culture. And it's a community for, for uh, software and for models. So it provides a number of uh, uh, apps and services that build the core also of our digital infrastructure uh, to uh, uh, manage models, uh, to close the gap between engineering artifacts and the documentation you have to, to provide, but it also uh, contains uh, or uh, people contribute uh, models that, that can be reused. Right? And it's, it's a, 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 a very good forum to exchange ideas and, and the challenges that we all face. So the, the community has been growing quite a bit. We are now over 400 members uh, with participants and adopters all, uh, from various industries, as you can see, uh, aerospace and, and automotive, but also academia. So that has become a key, uh, a key element in, in this strategy. And the goal, the vision of OpenB is to, to produce this global engineering ecosystem. Right? We, 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 we want to have this connected ecosystem because we are not only in an isolated place, but we, for example, JPL has to interact with other NASA centers, also with ESA across the, the ocean. And they all produce some, some engineering artifacts and documents and often disconnected. And uh, there are two, two elements that are part of this strategy. Uh, one is, is Jupiter as a central, central piece for, for multi-language capabilities with, to connect uh, modeling and, and, and engineering, uh, and SysML uh, v2. And uh, Ed, I think, will, well, Ed gives a keynote today in the, in the, the workshop. I think there was a tutorial uh, on, on Friday. So SysML v2 has evolved, I think, over the last years, really in a, in a very good direction. I think we have a, already now a, a, a stable specification or a good specification that makes me very, very hopeful for the, for the future. But this engineering ecosystem, you can comp compare this engineering ecosystem to the, to the web, right? When I, work, I worked at CERN in 1990 and the first web server went online. And uh, with OpenMB, the first engineering uh, server went online. So that's a, uh, uh, so I invite you to join the community to attend the, maybe the workshop today or the OpenMB uh, event tomorrow at the industry days where uh, a number of the, the uh, community members will present their, their work. Jupiter is a key piece uh, in this strategy as an analysis and visualization hub for, for models. It provides this very rich interactive exploratory and web-based uh, uh, environment to uh, connect modeling, engineering, data science, and, and, and a number of other things. System LV2 is also a key element in this strategy. Uh, it's not anymore constrained by UML. It has a new meta model. There is a, it's based on, on formal semantics and has a robust visualization with a flexible view and viewpoint specification. And also, most importantly, 
it has uh, it provides a standardized API to to access the models that you produce. And we also have, meanwhile, uh, uh, like in the reference implementation and integration with Jupyter. So you can put together in Jupyter your create your model, uh, visualize the model, and combine it with with documentation. And hopefully in the near future to actually analyze it also. Another key element in in all this executability and and uh, uh, and and uh, simulation world is is FMI. Uh, I'm not sure when it was initiated, but I think it maybe 10 years ago, and I think it was time. Long. Meanwhile, there is a, a whole lot of of uh, of uh, uh, organizations supporting it, and 100 plus tools, and uh, it enables sharing and and integration of uh, of different executed modes to, to enable co-simulation. Uh, so that is also in this world uh, of, of, there will be not the sing, single model that will do everything, but it will be a, a federation of models to, to enable you to do the analysis that you do. And FMI plays a key, key role in that. And uh, for SysML, we have, for the current SysML, I think we don't, we don't have, we haven't been able to produce FMIs. I hope with System LV2, it becomes much easier to produce a function mockup unit that you can run in a co-simulation with, with, with other models like, like Modelica, for example. Modelica is, is based on, on FMI standards for executability, so it'd be nice to combine those two. Another aspect, aspect is, is the, the model management. And right? so it has been and still is a big challenge to how do you organize your model so that you don't get crazy, right? With all this, if you if you if it becomes too big, it becomes unmanageable because you have you cannot uh, uh, configuration version control it properly. If you divide it up too early, uh, it's hard to to manage those dependencies as well between the packages. So so Conda shows how that should work or could work on, from the Python world. And we want to, to have something similar for the, for the models. I want to have some framework and Conda probably could manage that uh, to manage the dependencies and the, of, of my self-contained uh, models, right? I want to take something, so here it is, reuse it, integrate it into your model without trying to disentangle it from all kinds of other things. So to enable this, this uh, distribution of self-contained uh, packages and, and model reuse, right? So to broadcast these models, like on Conda channels, you broadcast Python packages. So this SysMLV2, Jupyter, Conda, and the FMI are kind of the kind of key pieces in, in that picture of the future uh, model-based engineering environment. Also, everything in, uh, in related to executability. So the, here you see, and that's my final slide, the next generation system engineering dream car. Jupiter in the center, system is the, the chassis, system v 2 is the engine, FMI and Condor are the wheels and OpenMV is the driver. So thank you very much uh, for your attention.